about me. Um, first, sort of 10 years of my career, I was um, in publishing. Um, and uh, particularly design magazines, uh, Frame in Amsterdam um, in design, and I was editor of Artichoke magazine. Um, then I did one of those pivot things that you do in your career um, and started working for Woods Bagot as um, in communications, um, which was, um, again, writing about design and architecture, um, but this time from the inside, um, and Bale architecture as well. Um, now I have my blog, which is about three years old, um, and I've just got this new job at the Australian Design Centre, um, helping them plan their exhibition program. Um, and I also do all these other bits and pieces of um, freelance writing, um, copywriting, um, speaking, various things. Um, and I guess all of that is a bit of a prelude to the fact that I'm not going to talk about any of that. I'm actually going to talk about um, my master's research, which I handed in earlier this year, which is about narratives and design. Um, so. Um, First of all, my thesis was not about architecture, my thesis was about object design, so furniture, lighting, object and product design. Um, and I, what I really wanted to do was to look at this word narrative because essentially it's bandied around a lot these days, storytelling this narrative that. And I kind of wanted to say, what does that mean? What, what does it mean to tell a story about an object? Um, and I really wanted to get into the theory, the, the nitty gritty of of what kinds of stories can be told about objects. Um, this will all be relevant for architecture later um, because the theory um, about narratives about objects also has relevance for narratives about buildings. Um, so really, this is the name of my thesis. Um, and it started essentially because I kept seeing this celebrity design narrative all through the media. Um, and I went to the Milan Furniture Fair and I saw the way that the designers were fated and the way they would, you know, um, uh, they had these back-to-back -back meetings, uh, interviews with journalists all day, everybody's treating them like gods. Um, and when I myself had to cover this event in the magazine, um, there's so much there and you do end up falling into the lazy trap as a journalist of following the big names. So you go, oh, it's a sofa, another sofa. And then you go, oh, but it's a Patricia Urquiola sofa. And then you think, oh, it must be good. And then I thought, no, why, why is it good? Because it has her name on it. Okay, yes, she's a good designer, but is that really what makes an object good? Um, so a lot of the starting point of this research was um, to kind of look at, to question that and to say what are the other narratives. Um, and uh, Gareth Williams is a curator in London and he calls, he calls it the ego system. So the brand, furniture brand, um, hires the designer. They need the designer to give their products cachet. Um, the media profiles the designer. Um, they need that for their stories to give them celebrity kind of angle that people want to read and everybody wins. The designer gets famous, um, the brand gets more money and the media gets their stories. Um, so it's sort of this vicious cycle but you know does it really mean anything? Um, Guy Julia calls him, him the designer hero and Lloyd and Snelders talk about the designers on omnipotence and they're interesting Lloyd and Snelders because they wrote a whole academic article saying what was and the whole point of it was uh, what was Philippe Stark thinking when he designed the GC Salif um, lemon squeezer and they kind of spend the whole article kind of imagining what was he thinking? Was he thinking about spaceships? Was he thinking about octopuses? Was he thinking about, you know, and they kind of think, well, he grew up in the 50s, so there was Sputnik and blah, blah, blah. And then at the end of the article, they say, you know, in this article, we're questioning whether the designer is, is you know, the most important aspect of an object. And we've used his name, something like, you know, 100 times in one article. So. Um, Essentially, my research um, boiled down to a few ways that narratives can be attached to objects. So, um, firstly, the designer is inspired 
by a narrative. Secondly, the narrative is in the object and interpreted by the user. And thirdly, that narratives are attached to objects by marketing and writing. And some of the theorists are quite negative about how that happens, but I think it's not always a bad thing. So the designer is storytelling. Uh, um, Gareth Williams did an exhibition called Telling Tales in London, um, and all of the designers were inspired by fairy tales. This is a really literal way that stories can inspire objects. And this is the Garden of Eden by Tord Bunche, a, a Dutch designer. Um, another paper by Grimaldi Fukingo and Honorescu wrote um, they actually categorise the types of design. So for them, the Anna G corkscrew is an example of design activating a mem remembered or associated story in the user. So essentially, this is a Freudian reference and they say that the, the little corkscrew get, gets all happy when the cork goes up her skirt. Um, <laughs> Um, this chair is by Dunn and Raby and it's got two nipples on it and they just vibrate randomly. So you create your own story in the moment story imagining in the user. Um, the next category, narratives, is a tool to understand and empathise with users. So this is when you go out to users and you collect the data. Um, this is a dream recorder which um, a, a designer um, used, I've forgotten his name right this moment, but he used it to collect data about people's dreams. Um, and on the right, um, this is um, a story of um, a love story, two cabins um, called Freya's Cabin and the, the lovers on either side of the lake. Um, so there's two cabins on either side of the lake. So this is an architectural example where um, the designer uses narrative elements in the design, similar to the Williams example, but this time in architecture. Design is accompanied by an, a narrative external to the object. Um, Significant Objects is a project by two journalists in America where they bought a huge amount of just trash, um, you know, like little elephant, white elephant stall knickknacks and just you know junky objects and they gave them to poets and fiction writers and asked them to write a story about it then they sold them on uh, online and the objects made a huge amount of money demonstrating and they they um, gave it all to charity but the project was demonstrating how adding a story to an object can increase its value um, and the last one is about how design structures the user experience over time as a narrative. So at a fairground, you, you're actually creating the experience of the narrative um, by over time as a journey for the user. Um, Stefan talks about um, narrative as uh, having a temporal sequence and meaning does not. So he, he differentiates between narrative and meaning. Um, and he, um, one of his examples is that you change the use of a bottle by putting flour in it. So that create over time, it goes from being uh, a receptacle for wine to a vase. And so that's his um, idea of narrative attached to an object. Um, and uh, Parsons talks about embedded narratives, and this is the um, doorbell, um, which is two wine glasses of different sizes, and when the doorbell rings, um, the little mechanism in the middle um, rings them, so it goes ding dong. So it creates this kind of narrative, come in, share a glass of wine. It's quite cute. So, how does this relate to architecture? Obviously, we have this architect, um, and I won't go into it too much, but essentially it's the same thing as the celebrity designer. It's really useful for real estate agents, and no architect really wants to be a star architect. I mean, there's probably some who do, but even the ones who are kind of, you know, maybe he doth protest too much, I don't know, but, um, you know, 
I don't think it's that interesting to talk about, to be honest, just a starting point. I think um, here, in the same way that designers are inspired by stories to create objects, architects can inspire, be inspired by stories to create build, buildings. So um, these are some of the ways that buildings have narratives attached to them. I won't go through them all because you can read. Um, but, um, you know, I think as as, a, um, as an architecture communicator, having this kind of list really helps you when you need to communicate about a building um, and you think, well, what am I going to say about this building because the architect's not helping me? Um, because often they're not very good at communicating. And so thinking about these things and getting sparking that story in the architect, because it, it, it's all there, it's just a matter of communicating it. Now, this is um, narratives embodied in the building, interpreted by users. So the way that we use buildings, and this is my parents' house, which they've sold last year. Um, but essentially, the building, the meaning of the building, we created the meaning, you know. We, having the piano with all, you know, my grandmother's stuff on it and doing, having Christmas there, and that's how that narrative gets attached to the building. And I think as architects, you need to remember that um, once you've designed a building, it has a life of its own and its stories of its own and often very personal stories that are really important. Um, and I think that architects are starting to realise that and that this idea of um, designing for human behaviour is um, uh, really gaining traction and uh, people are starting to think of buildings this way. Um, uh, Natalie Slesser from Lendlease, this is just a workplace design example, but, you know, um, realising that, um, that the interior that you designed for a company is actually going to have all of these meanings um, attached to it after the fact and trying to factor that into the design as you go forward. Gensler also um, has some new research about the experience-driven life, which is really fascinating. Um, and they talk a lot about human behaviour. And uh, also, Woods Baggett has a, a new thing called Superspace, which is kind of uh, collecting data on human behaviour and, you know, big data and, and trying to map how people um, move through spaces and that sort of thing, which is quite interesting. Um, lastly, narratives are attached by marketing and writing and um, uh, there's um, a connection I have, um, Eva Hagberg-Fisher, I haven't met her in person yet but we've been having a big email exchange because she's doing her masters as well on narratives. And um, she said, there's definitely a feeling when I write of slotting into a pre-existing narrative which I'll even tell people who are squirrely about being interviewed, I'm like. It'll go like this, desire for house, exciting challenge, design moves that met it, intimate moment, observation about architecture, collaborative excellence, further challenge, all challenges overcome, everyone happy, return to first quote. And having that in mind when you speak to a journalist, that that, that is the kind of formula that they're going to use to talk about this building is really useful um, when you're communicating. Finally, it can always go wrong, and Frank Gehry's been regretting this moment ever since it happened. Um, simplify, simplifying his whole architecture prof um, professional career down to a crumpled piece of paper.